Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Focus for Wednesday, March the 1st, 2023, at 12.53 p.m. Central Time. Today's Focus, when is a water pot... Not really a water pot. When is a water pot not really a water pot? I want you to think about this. When you're reading your Bible and it says water pot, when is it really a water pot and when is it really something else? When you read your Bible and it says it's a serpent, when is it really not a serpent? When you when you read a your Bible and it says a rock, but it's really not a rock. When you read your Bible and it says they took a three they took a three hour journey, when is it really not a three hour journey? When is a water pot not a water pot pot? That is the question that I want you to focus on today for today's focus. And it will all make sense. Maybe, maybe it will make sense. But let me explain. If you've been listening to our Bible study exercise, you know we're working on John chapter 4 this week. And some people have, well, at least one individual has raised a very important question in regards to a water pot that is mentioned in John chapter 4. Someone mentioned this water pot. And they, they, they asked some questions about it. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. They started listening to some sermons and these sermons were like, no, the water pot. I mean, it's a water pot, but it's not really a water pot. This water pot represents this and this and this and this and this and this. And they had all of these things. And so it raised this question. When is a water pot not a water pot? Now I could, I could, 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 I could just start reading John chapter four, reading the story, but I'm not going to do that. No, we're going to leave John chapter four right now. We're not, we're not going to go look at the text. We're going to take a step back into a, a, a Bible college that I attended where I received a textbook. The name of this textbook was First Principles of Bible Study. First Principles of Bible Study. And it was really a book, not so much about how to study the Bible. It was more a book about how to interpret the Bible. And I'm going to borrow a little bit from it because it gave a very particular hermeneutical system, a very, a very specific way of interpreting scripture. And I want to, you to hear a little bit of it because in a reality, this system that I was first taught, this was probably the, probably the very first real hermeneutical approach that had ever been given to me. Uh, up till that point, it was a lot of just like, well, you read it, you, you know, you, you compare scripture with scripture, you look, you know, you do cross-referencing, you highlight it, you underline it, you know, really not, nothing really specific. Nobody had given me any Bible study methods other than the Bible study methods I had learned. I've all told the story of the book that I bought at the Bible bookstore in Abilene, Texas, but now it was in Nebraska. And this was really the first school where I was going to actually learn some hermeneutics. Because if you remember, the Bible study methods were really observational tools, right? They didn't really give us, and I've taught the Bible study methods, and I've I've taught them over and over and over. They don't really give you hermeneutical principles as much as simply saying, here's how to study the text. And when they say study the text, here's how to observe what is in the text. And of course, observation always comes before interpretation. So I am so grateful for those Bible study methods because that got me learning how to observe the text. How to interpret it, I was still a little bit like iffy on how to handle this and what to do and what you could or couldn't do. So this was really, I think in in certain ways, my first real step into this world of hermeneutics. Now they were referring to it as Bible study, but it was really kind of an introduction to hermeneutics. And I was... I was, in, I mean, I, I I definitely was in for somewhat of a shock or a surprise because of the way they approached it. And, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make this work, how to make this work. When does, because there are times I think it does work, but there are times that I'm like, I, I have a problem. And so when it comes to, well, the woman in John chapter four and her water pot, does it work there? 
Here's a, a place that I tried to use this a lot was John the Baptist. When it, when it describes John the Baptist and his clothing, is it just describing his clothing or do, and his diet? Because it usually, usually the Bible doesn't describe someone's clothing or someone's diet. But because it describes John the Baptist's clothing and diet, does, is that something that where you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. The text is trying to get my attention here because in John 4, it specifically says she left her water pot. I mean, at least a good observation may go, well, maybe the author does want us to pay attention to the water pot and maybe the water pot isn't the water pot. John the Baptist, when you look at his clothing and you look at his diet, you can go, well, wait a minute. Okay, so let's take this, consider John the Baptist. Technically, he's the last Old Testament prophet. Okay, that's interesting. If you go back and look at the Old Testament prophets, they have a, they had a tendency to serve at times as almost a, a living illustration, right? They would either take off their clothes, they would lay down on their side, they would do, they would do all of these interesting things to somehow demonstrate to the people. They, they served as a living illustration, like, okay, guys, I've been trying to preach this message. Now, I'm going to demonstrate the message by what I'm doing with, with either my actions or my dress or what I'm eating. So in a sense, you you would think John the Baptist may fit that same category, right? He's the last Old Testament prophet. So when you look at his clothing and you look at his diet, is he in a way trying to tell Israel that you're unclean, that you have chased after, in a sense, false gospels and false religion, and you're about to partake or eat of the judgment of God? Now, I'd have to go through and explain how each piece of clothing represents this and this and this, but I was taught this, and I was always like so impressed with this idea because I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of argumentation there that would kind of prove that maybe John the Baptist's clothing and diet does actually picture something because, I mean, where else does it say? And Peter was wearing this and eating this. And John, uh, not John the Baptist, but the other John, and, and this and James and, and Zebedee, and, and we can go through all of the, it doesn't usually describe what they're wearing in any way, shape, or form. But John the Baptist, we get his diet and we get his clothing. So any good observation can make you go, well, I wonder why. Well, then he's the last Old Testament prophet. Let's go back to the Old Testament prophets. Think of the things Isaiah did. Think of the things Ezekiel did. Just think think of some of the things that that was happening with these prophets. Jeremiah, many of them, that that they, they constantly were living out these like living illustrations. So you put all that together. I think then it's okay to go, maybe something is going on here, but you gotta be very careful. Because if you're not very careful, every single time you'll be like, oh, wait, look at that. Look at that. That's not really that. That's not really dirt. That's not really water. That's not really a mountain. That's not really a donkey. That's not. And all of a sudden, it will just become this world of everything is a picture. Everything is an allegory. So how do we control this? How do we balance this? So in John chapter 4, this woman and her water pot. Is it a water pot or is it more? So let's go back to, well, what I learned, all right? And I'm going to be borrowing from this book. I'm just going to, I have a PDF version of it, but I'm just going to, I'm basically going to chapter three of the book. And basically chapter three asks this question, does the, does the Bible have more than one level of meaning? Does the Bible have more than one level of meaning? I think the chapter really is more of a declarative statement. The Bible has more more than one level of meaning, but I am asking it more in a question form. Does the Bible have more than one level of meaning? In other words, when you look at a text of Scripture, are there multiple layers of meaning, and you've got to identify each layer of meaning and then figure out what it is saying based on that level of meaning. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example here. Thus, now I'm just quoting from the book. Thus far in our study, two important principles have been discovered that must be kept in mind as we study the Bible. They are, number one, the Bible alone and in its entirety is the word of God. Okay, we can agree with that. The Bible alone and in its entirety is the word of God. Number two, we are to interpret scripture with scripture. 
Okay. Now I know where that phrase comes from. I, we, we could, we could get into a little debate here. I know everyone loves to say that we interpret scripture with scripture, but I don't know if anyone really knows what that means because here's what it typically it means. It's like, well, okay. I, they look at a scripture and then they just go find a, a random cross reference somewhere and just somehow try to link them together. Well, it uses the same word or, or I mean, this has to be connected. And it's like, well, I don't know if I see the connection. Hey, hey, we interpret scripture with scripture. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you can just go grab any random scripture and connect it to the scripture you're looking at and somehow draw a conclusion. There's got to be a rhyme or reason why you're looking at that as a cross reference. And you got to make sure you're not destroying the context of one passage in order to try to prove a context of a separate passage. You've got to figure out what you're there. In other words, this requires a little bit of skill and thinking and a little bit of caution. You can't just like, because I see it all the time. You'll say, well, I don't know if that scripture, oh, wait, 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 wait. And then they'll quote something and you'll be like, well, why are you quoting that scripture with scripture? And I'm like, I don't know why you're quoting that scripture. That has literally nothing to do with the scripture we're looking at. And they will look at you like you're out of your mind. Like, of course it has something to do with it. So, but, so, but for, in, in theory, we'll say we will, we will agree with these two points. Number one, the Bible alone and in its entirety is the word of God. Okay. We, I, I can agree with that. Number two, we are to interpret scripture with scripture. I will say this. Obviously. Whatever conclusion we come to in one scripture needs to be consistent with the rest of the Bible. We can agree if we state it that way. All right? I think we can agree. And, and the, the book says, keep these principles in mind and truth will be found from the Bible. All right, now here we go. The use of words and phrases must be studied in individual sentences the context in which the sentence is used and how they are used elsewhere in the Bible. The more familiar with the, the more familiar the student is with the entire Bible, the more he will be helped in his study. Okay. I, I don't, I don't think we have a problem with that. Let me read that again. The use of words and phrases must be studied in individual sentences, the context in which these sentences is used and how they are used elsewhere in the Bible. The more familiar the student is with the entire Bible, the more he will be helped in his study. We can agree with that. Next, we must recognize that the Bible is God's word. The Holy Spirit leads us into truth. Now there, I have a problem. All right. I've been taught that my entire, no matter every school I've gone to, I have been told the Holy Spirit will lead us into truth. And you know my feelings on that. That's absolutely not true. Because <laughs> if the Holy Spirit was leading us into all truth, then there would be unity. There would be one commentary, one church, one doctrine. We don't agree on anything. So the Holy Spirit cannot be leading us all into truth when nobody agrees on anything. And people die still disagreeing with other people. So the Holy Spirit was leading the original uh, authors of the New Testament and all the biblical authors into truth. The Holy Spirit was because of, of inspiration. All scripture is given by inspiration. God breathed. The Spirit moved. They, man did not write according to their own will, but God, God moved them by the Holy Spirit to write ultimately what he wanted recorded. So I, I but once again, this is a school where the, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. Really? Really? So, so because your school is teaching what's different than that school and that school is teaching what's different than that school and your church is teaching different than that church and none of the students can even agree on. So no, no, it, it doesn't work that way. I know everyone wants to claim it, but we don't. And again, if the Holy Spirit's leading us into all truth, then why do we even need hermeneutics or, or biblical Bible study methods, right? All we need to do is read the Bible and the Holy Spirit's going to get me there. Correct. So, yeah, I have major issues with this. All right, let's continue. If we study diligently and pray that God will open our spiritual eyes to the truths hidden in the word, we will grow in grace. Now, this is the same. I've heard people say this. What do you do when you don't understand a scripture? I've heard Christians say this a thousand times. Well, I pray and God will show me what it means. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Good luck with that. Because the minute you say that, you know what you're saying. That whatever interpretation you come up with well, it came from God, therefore your interpretation is infallible. That's dangerous. Next paragraph. We will now look at a third principle, which is of great importance. 
It must be understood to realize the spiritual riches of the Bible. And here it is, that principle, here is the principle. The Bible ordinarily has more than one level of meaning. The Bible ordinarily has more than one level of meaning. And in this school, I was constantly given text of scripture and I had to articulate and outline each level of meaning for that passage of scripture. Here's level one, here's level two, and here is level three. Here's how it broke down. These levels are, there are three levels, right? These are the levels that were given to me. Number one, the historical setting. All right, so John 4, it's a historical setting. Here's a woman. Here's the area which she lived. She's a Samaritan. They're in Samaria. Jesus is there. She's at a, a, an actual physical well. She's looking for water. Jesus is offering something different, a living water. Okay, she has a water pot. She leaves the water pot. Yeah, okay. Like everything is just very literal. Everything is actual what it is. You're just looking at the historical. You can almost call this the, the literal setting. You can almost call it the literal setting. It's historical, literal facts, right? That, that, that was actually a rock. That was actually this. That was actually that. It was an actual, histor actual historical truth. You, you really handle this in a very literal, 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 literal way. Right? Like John the Baptist was, was literally wearing this clothing. He was literally eating that food. It was, he was literally eating that. No one's questioning the literal aspect of it. But this system of hermeneutic is going to say, however, there's different levels. So first we just establish, establish what is literal and what is historic. Now what's the second? The second is the moral or spiritual teaching. So once you establish level one, and again, this is the way I was taught. I'm not, I'm not promoting this. I, I mean, I, I've got my issues with some of this, but I want you at least to understand how this shows up. The, the moral or spiritual teaching, the moral or spiritual teaching. And just so that you know, this is very similar to what I learned in a Catholic university working on a degree in theology when I had to learn Catholic hermeneutics, okay? So this is very similar to their practice as well. But the moral or spiritual teaching. I think, I think in the Catholic church, there's four levels. I think there's four levels in the Catholic church. I think there's four levels. I'd have to pull out the, cate uh, the catechism. I don't have it next to me, but um, I have them, I have one at church. So we may have to look at that sometime soon and I can help you understand how that works. But here we go. The moral or spiritual teaching. So you have the historical setting, the literal, the actual, and then you step back and go, okay, level two, what is the moral teaching here? What is the spiritual teaching here? Right? J John four. Okay. Obviously it's about a woman. She has a discussion with Jesus. Okay. But what's the moral spiritual teaching? Well, the, the spiritual teaching here obviously is she's look, she's thinking about actual physical water. Jesus is trying to point her to a, a living water and this living water. And then we could try to figure out exactly what that is, but clearly this is ultimately talking about salvation. The spiritual teaching here is this woman needed salvation. And then we could talk about the moral teaching. Is there a moral teaching because Jesus did go through Samaria and the Jews typically hated the Samaritans? Is there a moral teaching there that we should love even those who are considered our enemy, right? In other words, is there a moral teaching there? Is there a spiritual teaching here? Okay, so there's the historical level. That's the very literal. There's the moral and spiritual. And then number three, this is where things get interesting. This one is referred to as the salvation account. The salvation account. So you've got this literal historical account. There may be a moral or spiritual teaching, but somewhere according to this system, that somehow in these stories, it is giving you the account. It's giving you a picture. In other words, the historical narrative serves as a actually as an allegory, as a picture of salvation. It does not deny the literal historical accuracy, but it's like, oh, here's this literal historical story, but wait, 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 wait. It actually pictures salvation. 
So it was a literal historical account that they offered up a lamb as a sacrifice, right? There, there's a moral or spiritual teaching maybe that, that God is holy and man is sinful, so we need a substitute. But that it's a salvation account would be, it pictures Jesus Christ shedding his blood for us. Right? Now, let me read a little bit about this third level of meaning. The third level of meaning persistently shines through the scriptures. The Bible is the presentation of the gospel of grace. Unquestionably, this is the most important purpose of the Bible. It was written that mankind might know of its need of a savior. They quote John 20, verse 31, which says, But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. God tells mankind about his terrible predicament through his salvation program. He discloses to us that without Christ, we are condemned to eternal damnation because of our sins. Wonderfully, God shows us the escape that he provided through the Lord Jesus Christ. This presentation of the gospel is given in two basic ways. Number one, by means of statements which speak directly to the question of salvation. Sometimes it, the Bible just says, this is what you need to know about salvation. Okay, we can, all, we can all understand that. But sometimes the way this message is given is in the third level of meaning, which is the, spirit, the salvation account. And it works this way. By means of historical events... And phrases which are types or figures of God's salvation program. These two methods of gospel presentation will now be examined. And then they go in trying to examine them. So, for example, John the Baptist, literal historical person. Got you. All right. What is he doing? Well, he's doing certain actions like baptizing. But that baptism actually may have a moral and spiritual teaching because typically baptism was done for Gentiles converting to Judaism. They would have to be bathed. Here, John the Baptist is baptizing Jews. So there's a moral, social, a moral, a spiritual teaching happening here that even the Jews need to be washed. The Jews need to be cleansed because the Jews are in rebellion to God. All right, that they they have abandoned God and they need to return back and in a sense be ready for the coming Messiah. All right, so there's kind of like there's a literal water, but there's a uh, a moral and spiritual teaching. Okay, and and that it also morally is showing that the Jews were no better than the Gentiles. However, John the Baptist was also wearing clothing and eating food, and many would say there is the gospel account. There is the salvation account because he is demonstrating by his clothing that Israel is unclean before God and that what he's eating, it's demonstrating that they're going to uh, partake of uh, judgment and that they had chased, chased after basically false gospels and turned to idolatry. And so he's demonstrating that. So you have the historical account, you have the moral and spiritual, and you have the salvation account. So in John 4, this is the way this would be approached. You have the historical account. You have Jesus going to a specific place, right? Right? You have Jesus who goes through, he, he, he cometh to a city of Samaria, which is called Sakar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to the son of Joseph. There's an actual well. It's Jacob's well. This is all historical account. There's a woman. Jesus is there. They start talking about water, all of this. There is, there, there is, all of this is happening. There is a moral, spiritual lesson because Jesus is talking to the Samaritans. We have all of that. So we have the historical account. We have the moral, spiritual, right? Jesus is showing compassion and love, not only to a woman uh, who, may be, who may be viewed as scandalous by, by her counterparts, but he's also talking to a Samaritan, which the Jews typically would not. And he went into this area where they typically would not. They would see this as the the moral and spiritual account. But the salvation account happens when Jesus then gets the discussion from physical water to living water, right? He gets it there. He confronts her, many would say, with her situation to try to confront her of her sin. He, he then, there's, there's obviously clear spiritual teaching. And then many would say, and, and John 4, 27, 
And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the man, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did is not this the Christ. And what people would say here is, wait a minute, look, 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 look. Here's the spiritual account. This woman listened to Jesus. This woman believed. And she, this, her salvation is demonstrated by the fact that she left her water pot. And since she left her old way of life, she left what she came seeking, which was water, because now she had found spiritual. She left it. This is a sign of repentance. This is a sign of forsaking everything. And then she went and immediately started telling people about Jesus because she left the service, in a sense, of getting water from a well. Now she has abandoned that and she has taken up the service of delivering living water to other people that she left the water pot of physical water so that she could now give everyone in a sense the spiritual water pot of salvation and they would say see there's all three levels are present the historical the moral and spiritual and the salvation account now at times it can preach really really good at times it works and look, there's, there's situations where I think, wow, a good example is Ruth. Look at the story of Ruth. Look at the name of the children. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Look at the, how it's described. And you're like, wow, this really describes the spiritual condition. And then look at what Ruth does. And, and then look at, and then the kinsman redeemed. And, and, and we're like, wait, it's a historical account. Yes, there's moral and spiritual lessons, but there, this is a salvation account. The salvation account is there. The th- but but it's, three, it's three levels down. We, we can look at all the actual historical, literal account, right? We can, we can see some of the moral and spiritual teaching, but there is the salvation account if we will dig in deep enough. And again, John the Baptist, I always go to that one because that was one of my favorite ones that I learned. Ruth was, was another favorite one that I've learned. But here in John 4, so then is the water pot a water pot? Is the water pot a water pot or it does it actually have a deeper level of meaning? Now we have to be really careful how we handle this because I'm telling you, you can go crazy. You can just run through every story and go, oh, there, 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 there. Look, look at what Jesus is doing here. Wait, 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 wait. That's not just mud. Wait, why did he spit? Okay, no, oh, that represents being uh, accursed by the law. Okay, wait, what does this represent? What does this represent? And you can go with it. And it, and it, and listen, there, there, it, it can be fun. It can be exciting. It can be thrilling. But if you're not careful, you'll, you'll, you'll basically drive the car right off the road through the fence, hit a couple of cows over a cliff, crash at the bottom, then the, mount, the, the, the cliff will collapse on top of where you crash, and then a nuclear weapon will hit it, and then it'll all be thrown into a volcano. The, obviously, what I'm saying is it can go way horribly wrong. Way horribly wrong. Horribly wrong. And how do I know it can go horribly wrong? Well, that school where I learned that, well, the person in charge of that school started predicting that the world was going to end in 1994. And he wrote an entire book called 1994. And then when that didn't work, it was going to end somewhere in the 2000s. And then he said that the church age was over and everyone have to abandon their church. And if they stayed in their church, they had taken the mark of the beast. And then, and then it, was, it just went on and on and on. But he would have been telling you, it's the third, uh, you know, these three levels of meaning right here. And he, he wasn't listening to extra biblical revelation. It was scripture, scripture alone. But he just, his hermeneutic just, and I'm not saying that anyone who embraces this hermeneutic ends up there. I'm just saying that sooner or later, you can just start making everything say whatever you want it to say. So, today's focus, the water pot. What do you think? Is it significant that she left it? I mean, the text, the text clearly tells us she left it. I mean, and, and I, I think even from the most historical level, there's got to be some significance to that, right? Because that's what she came there for. She came there in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day to get water. And now she doesn't even care. She just leaves it. 
because now something else is more important to her. I think that there's a moral and spiritual teaching there. And I think that's fair to say. I mean, clearly she, she came there in the middle of the day in John four, you can read the text for yourself because this, the, the goal of this was not to exegete it. We'll be working on it more in the Bible study exercise, but I'm so glad the person brought this up because it brings up these hermeneutical issues, but I don't think you can just ignore it. See, I, here's the thing. Sometimes we can be so like, no, we're going to take a historical, grammatical, literal approach. And, and we should. I still think that that's the way to approach it. But I think sometimes we can then overlook some things that the text mentions. Look, I think we have to be able to observe everything. And when the text, like, well, wait a minute. Just think about it from a logical perspective in the most literal, historical, grammatical way you can. She came there in the middle of the day. She came there alone. Mo- which most understand that she came there alone because she was somewhat considered scandalous or something. She comes alone. She's there to get water. And when it's all said and done, she leaves the water pot. She just leaves it. Now you have to at least acknowledge that is significant, even in the most historical, literal perspective. It's got to demonstrate something. It had to demonstrate that at that moment, she didn't care anymore about that physical water. What she cared about was this spiritual water that she has now has taken, and she wants to share it with everyone. She obviously was coming to get water, and that water would have not just been for her. It would have been for the man she was living with. It would have been for, I don't know if children were involved, or whomever. But now she doesn't care about that. She's focused on this living water. Now, we can ask, what is the living water? Some have identified the living water as the Holy Spirit. I think, I think if we identify it as the Holy Spirit, which I think there's some scriptures to support it, I think ultimately what it's saying is, hey, you believe in me, you'll get salvation. I think the Holy Spirit represents salvation. We have the living water of the Holy Spirit inside of us. And just like we need water, we need physical water to survive, as a Christian, we, we, our salvation is sealed. We are kept saved, in a sense, by the sealing of the Holy Spirit, which is inside of us. So, in a sense, we have all that we need to be sustained in our salvation because we have God himself dwelling inside of us. Now, I know some people will try to argue, well, that means we now have power to do A, B, C, and D. That's a whole different argument. So I'm still focusing on exactly how, what we do with the living water. Someone moved on to the water pot, which is great. But now it brings up this. So is the water pot the water pot? Well, I think it is a water pot. And I think if we even look at the water pot and the most literal, and if I, I keep feel like, I feel, I keep feel like I'm saying water park. I'm not saying water park. Water pot, okay. Hopefully I'm not, I've not stated it incorrectly. But I think if we look at it in the most literal way, it's still a beautiful sign that, She came there for this, but she left focused on something else. That when we come to Christ, our minds change about everything, right? Our minds change. That's what I think true repentance is, is a change of mind. A change of mind about God, about sin, about salvation, about what's more important, right? There's a change in the way we think. Oh, we still struggle with the reality of the sin inside of us that doesn't really care how we think now. And there's the battle. But I think clearly you see a change in her thinking because no reasonable person would have come all the way there to get water and then just like, I'm out, guys. I'm I'm, I'm leaving it. No, she would have been like, I'm taking the water pot. I'm going to take the water pot back home. I'm going to make sure everyone has the water they need. Then I'm going to go tell everyone. But she's just demonstrating a whole new priority. And that's in the most literal way. We don't even need to go in a spiritual way. Now, does it represent that she repented of her sin and she left all of her sin? Well, we know she didn't leave all of her sin because nobody leaves all of their sin. We take our sin with us. Now, we may change our minds about sin, but we don't leave it because we still sin all the time. You can't say, well, she forsook everything to follow Christ. Well, I mean, come on. She's, you know she's going back to get the water at some point, right? We all know that, right? It would be ridiculous to think she never went back to get water ever again. No, the next, she probably, after she told everyone, went back to get her water because she knew the family needed it at home. And the next day she came to get water. And the next day she came to get water. And the next day she came to get water because you need water to live. So you got to be careful how far you take your, your allegorizing it because you know it, it's going to fall apart at some point. 
So when is a water pot a water pot? And when is it not? Right? When, um, another example, another example, John chapter 2, verse 6, verse 5, uh, his mother saith unto the servants, whatever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three uh, fir- firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and, the, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And guess what? The water now is wine. Jesus turned the water into wine. Jesus turned the water into wine. Are those water pots water pots? I've heard all kinds of examples that, well, they are water pots. Jesus did turn it into wine, but there's a moral, there's a moral and spiritual teaching. What is the moral and spiritual teaching here? Well, Jesus demonstrated compassion and love for the wedding feast and, and protecting it, you know, that they ran out of wine. Okay. Maybe just kind of just a, a, a general kind of compassion and love for people. But then some people say, well, these water pots represent maybe the six days of creation, right? They represent God's ability to transform water into wine and that he can transform our life. Like there's all these, and then everyone goes for the spirit, for the salvation account and can go crazy with it. How do you know when that's acceptable? How do you know? How do you know? My, My thinking is always, you've got to look for clues in the text, right? Sometimes the text, it will just, to me personally, sometimes you'll just see, wait a minute. Like, for example, again, I'll always go back to John the Baptist. Knowing he's the last Old Testament prophet and knowing the details it gives about the clothing and the food, it just seems like there's got to be more going on. Here, I do think it's interesting in John 4, and I would have overlooked this. I would not even have seen this because I was so focused on the living water. I don't know if I would have even caught this, but someone said, she left the water pot. And the text literally takes the time to say, she left the water pot. Okay, clearly the text wants us to focus. Clearly it's just not thrown in. Oh, and by the way, she left the water pot. No, immediately that should make us as a good, and I obviously was not a good reader of this text because any good reader should stop and go, wait, that's what she came there for. Why is she leaving that? Well, clearly then, clearly This is trying to go beyond just the mere details that she left it. Now, we've got to be careful how far we take it because we do, if we're like, oh, this means she left sin once and for all. She forsook all to follow Christ. Come on. We got to be careful with that because we know she's coming back to get it. I mean, I mean that, that you got to be careful there, but it does demonstrate a change of priority does show a change of focus. But the water pot is still a water pot, right? I don't think the water pot represents her sin. I don't think it represents, you know, if you wanted to take it that far, then it should have said she left the man she was living with. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) It's funny. The water pot means she left her sin. Not if she went back home to the man she was living with who wasn't her husband. She didn't. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Right. Did she go back home and say, look, I'm living with you, but we're never going to have physical relations again. We're never going to. Did she do that? I mean, that's the way people somehow preach it. I, I don't know. Did she really leave all of her sin? Yeah, and someone said, "Why mention it all?" Yeah, I, I think, I think, I think it's, the, I think, it, I think it, it has to be there for a reason, and I think it does demonstrate a change of priority and a change of focus. I think, I think that's the most literal way to look at it. I think if we if we go too deep with it, it kind of begins to fall apart, right? Because we know she's coming back to get it. We know she's going to be there the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And there's nothing in the text that says. I mean, if, if, if they really, if the text really wanted to demonstrate she left her sin once and for all, it would have say she never went back home to the man she's living with, or she went back and said, look, we have to get married tomorrow. But the text doesn't mention that in any way, shape or form. So we got to be careful. Now people can say, well, of course she did that. Really? Are, 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 yeah. All right. Come on. We don't know that. Plenty of people get saved in church on a Sunday, Right and still go back home 
and into all kinds of sinful situations and still continue to sin and struggle with sin because we all do. I've been saved a long time. I still struggle with sin. I know shocking, shocking, isn't it? I still struggle with wrong desires, wrong thought, thoughts, wrong focuses. I still do it all the time. Wrong priorities. Wrong priorities. She left the water pot. At that moment, she had the right priority and the right focus. I, I sometimes don't leave the water pot, and I'm like, I'm going to sit right here with the water pot because this is what I want to focus on. I can give all kinds of examples of that. All right. Well, there's kind of a a short today's focus. It was only supposed to be uh, 15 minutes, but we went for it. I knew it was going to go long. But uh, so what I'm saying is, hey, if you haven't been listening to the Bible study exercise on John chapter four, please start listening and start working on John chapter four. But I want us today to focus on the water pot. When is a water pot not a water pot? And that is your today's focus for Wednesday, March the 1st, 2023.